to everyone. I just had my little recording mention, uh, message. Um, great to say, see some names I recognise as well. Um, so welcome to everyone from England and Wales. Uh, for the purposes of audio description, I'm a white woman with long, uh, light brown hair, wearing glasses and a black and white spotted top. And I'm sat in my office with an orange sofa behind me and prints on the wall, music, uh, film, dance, art related. So um, if uh, Jack wouldn't mind uh, sharing the screen with my PowerPoint, because for some reason, first time ever, it wouldn't properly work for, for me. Uh, so thank you. Just on that first uh, slide, if we go to the second slide, um, you will see the uh, agenda for today's session. Thanks, Jack. So um, just so you know, you're on the right session. Um, we're going to be talking about audience segmentation uh, today with a, with a specific uh, lens of online audiences. I'm going to look at what the benefits are for your organisation, different models. Some of you, I'm sure, will be very familiar with various audience segmentation models, how relevant they are to uh, thinking about online audiences. Um, and because audience segmentation models rely on data, we're going to talk a bit about um, data and best practice around that, and then specifically how to use that segmentation to inform targeted communications uh, for online um, audiences. And I'm going to be talking about some specific case studies um, through the session as well. As uh, Jack and Sarah have said, please feel free to um, pop uh, thoughts, questions in the chat as we go through today, and I'll, I'll have a look at those um, later on, and, and we'll be dealing with questions at the end of the session. So if we just move to the next uh, slide. Thank you. So I've um, got a little, another little poll, but doing this through um, menti.com. So if, if you've got, now don't worry if you can't access menti.com, you can put your answers in the chat. Um, if you can, if you just go to www.menti.com and it will ask you to enter a code and the code is on the screen, one six six zero two three zero nine, and Jack, if you can just stop that share, and I'll bring the the Menti screen on, which also has the code on. So, if you bear with me one second, there we go. Can everyone see that? I know that uh, people are are putting in their um, answers because they're they're showing. And, uh, and they're moving, so that's good. Okay, I'll just, just give it a, a few more um, seconds as you all grapple with, with Menti. Okay. Great. So we can see can see that there's uh, answers to in all of the in all of the categories except don't know, which I'm really pleased to hear. Uh, so you all have an idea of what audience segmentation um, means. Um, I think it's oh still getting some still getting some answers in, and up in the lead is a uh, way to better understand our existing audiences. So thanks. I think I think we'll stop it there. Um, Oh, another one, just, sorry. I'll just let a few more people take that, take the poll. Great, I think it's leveling out now. Okay, brilliant. So every time I say that, there's another one. Okay, so we've got a um, majority of people saying it's a way to better understand our existing audiences. And um, the next highest uh, category is help to inform marketing planning. Actually, you probably guessed there are no wrong answers on here. Um, audience segmentation can mean all of those things for you as an organisation. So I'm just going to stop the share. So thank you very much for doing that. And if Jack can take us back to the presentation. And we can go on to the next uh, slide. I don't know why it's, it's showing the current slide and the next slide, Jack. So I don't know if it's if there's a reason why it's doing that. Anyway, uh, we'll try again. Sorry, I'll, yeah, I'll just redo it. Sorry. 
so I'm going to now share with you the audience agency's um, definition of audience segmentation. So you'll see that it's, it, thank you. And let's just see if that can, uh, there, oh, weirdly, uh, we've got the logo in the middle of the, um, the definition. Anyway, so segmentation is a useful technique to help organizations manage a range of relationships and forms a cornerstone of a good audience development plan. Segmentation is simply the process of dividing and organizing the population into meaningful and manageable groups or segments so that you can tailor your cultural offer and communications to the preferences of each group. And I should say, I'm quite happy for this presentation to be shared after the session. So don't worry about trying to um, uh, jot down things like this definition. So one of the uh, answers uh, that some of you um, uh, uh, ticked was about these, uh, putting uh, people into these segments, into manageable groups. So, but segmentation, is basically a tool to help you understand your audiences and also how to communicate most effectively with them. Next slide, please, Jack. So why is that helpful? Um, can I have a quick show of hands uh, for how many people are currently using audience segmentation? Okay. So so not not many. OK, that's what I what I suspected. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's why it's useful um, and specifically in relation to online audiences. So when we talk about segmentation and, and that definition that you saw then, which is talking about audience development, it's really important that segmentation is, is about audience development as much as it's about marketing. And audience development, as you all know, uh, being museum uh, professionals, is about everything to do with your relationship with audiences. So it's all of the touch points that you have with audiences in person and online. And that's before they, uh, they engage with you, that's when they're engaging with you, and that's after they've engaged with you, because you want them to keep coming back. Um, Manchester Jewish Museum is one of my uh, clients um, and they've just gone through a big capital um, redevelopment uh, challenge during COVID times as well, but they reopened um, this summer. It's a fabulous um, capital development. So if any of you are in Manchester at any point, it's definitely worth a visit. And they have actually, they created their own segmentation working with um uh, a brand professional because the existing segmentation tools and I'm going to talk about those tools later on in the session didn't quite capture some of the audiences that they engage with particularly their traditional Jewish audiences whose relationship with the museum is strongly based on their faith and also what they call more radical activists so those people who are much more interested in, a, in a, a proactive relationship with the museum and what it stands for. So they developed their own um, segmentation. And the other reason was because they've been closed for a while and they didn't actually have much data to start with. And I'm sure some of you may be in, this, in the same situation that you don't have a lot of audience um, data. So what they've done is they, they also recognised that there were audiences they wanted to engage with when they reopened, but actually those audiences were maybe not likely to come for the day-to-day -day museum offer. And so they created, and they've just launched it actually, a, a, a Thursday late series called Synagogue Nights. And that programme is a mix of uh, comedy, music, everything from drag nights um, to craft based to talks, um, a real mix of more contemporary cultural um, experiences uh, that talk about the contemporary Jewish life. And so their segmentation, they've looked at, actually we want to get to these types of audiences um, so much more what you would probably call, um, what the audience agency would call experience seekers, and I'll explain that a bit later on. Um, 
And now that they've been open a while and they are a paid for uh, museum and they're gathering data, they can now start mapping their own segmentation against a recognized segmentation model and they, they're using um, audience spectrum, which is the audience agency segmentation model. So segmentation is not just about marketing. It's also about things like programming and product development, but it can also help to inform income generation. Um, so whether that's merchandising, particularly fundraising, you get an understanding of the types of visitors. And I use the term audience and visitors interchangeably. So for, forgive me, audience, I mean a very wide term for that. For that. Um, but they, use, they can use that information to see who's much more likely to want to give to the organisation um, as well. And that's really important. And then, of course, customer service. So understanding the needs of your audiences should help you to reflect on your customer service or your visitor service, as, as um, I know that's a term that's more often used in, in museums. Of course, Understanding your audiences then helps you to tailor any marketing campaigns to be more uh, targeted and focused um, and to, to, sh to shape your messaging according to those different audiences. So don't assume that all your audiences will respond to the same messages. And of course, you can then track those, those campaigns. And I'm going to talk a bit about that later on. So hopefully you should be... Um, more effective in the use of your limited um, budgets and resources, because people as well as, as money and totally understand that. And let's face it, we're all a lot more strapped as far as resources than, than we were pre-pandemic. The other thing with segmentation tools is it's not just about understanding your existing audiences, it can help you see where there's a scope for growth. So where there are audiences within striking distance of your museum, who are interested in museums, but are not engaging with you. Um, and that's something that um, working with whoever you uh, decide to, to work with, if you want to uh, use a, an established audience segmentation model can help you to find. Of course, the other thing is research evaluation and, and insight. So if you understand your audiences, who they are, the marketing activity that you're doing to get to those audiences and you're evaluating those, those audiences, their responses to you, you can then map that against your audience segmentation profile. In other words, the people that you want to attract, are you attracting them? Are they engaging with you how you expect? And this goes for in real life and uh, online so that it becomes a virtuous circle of um, that understanding, evaluation, planning, and going again. Thanks, Jack. Next slide, please. So um, I've, I've bottled this down into, into four words that the audience agency use when it comes to segmentation. And there's a link on the screen when you get the PowerPoint, you'll be able to look at that and it goes into more detail. But really, any segmentation tool you use has to be relevant to you. The segments have to be distinguishable. So there's no point having a number of segments where you can't tell the difference between those segments and therefore you don't know what to do with that information. The segments also have to be a decent size. There's no point having a size of segment that's like 100 people because that's just not going to be useful at all. Bearing in mind that that segment, only a percentage will be potentially interested in what you have to offer. And you have to be able to locate those segments. You have to know where they are so that you can then tailor your marketing activity to those segments. Next slide, please, Jack. OK, so I'm going to talk through the different types of um, segmentation so that you get a, a bit of an understanding of uh, and forgive me for those who are already using segmentation and may know this already, um, the different ways they use data. So firstly, um, behavioral. So this is how have audiences already engaged with you? Um, and so if you are tracking that, so whether you are I'm thinking about online audiences in particular, whether you are, are tracking that behavior, in other words, how are they finding out about what you have to offer? 
who's actually engaged with you, how many times are they coming, what type of content have they engaged with, did, did you charge, did they, did they buy, uh, have they gone on to buy something else, um, and what kinds of communications do they prefer, are they responding more to social media, or, or to email uh, communications, for example. So I put Amazon and Netflix as an example, just to help so you can understand. So you know when you buy something on Amazon and they say, oh, you bought this. Other people who bought that have bought this or you bought this, so would you like to buy this? Which that's fine if you're just buying for yourself. But you know, if I'm buying Justin Bieber's album for my teenage niece and then they're saying, do you want to buy his next album? No, I don't really. Um, so they have limitations um, in that uh, behaviour. And similarly on Netflix, you'll get recommendations coming through based on what you've already watched. Um, next slide, please, Jack. So demographic. So this is kind of the, the basic kinds of, of data. So that's age and social grade or where you are in your life stage. So, you know, if you're single, married with children, retired, um, what your family uh, circumstances. So um, if you think about the census, the kind of questions that you were asked, I'm sure you all filled out the census, um, the kinds of questions you were asked in, in, the, in the recent uh, census. Thank you, Jack. And then there's geographical, so um, where people live and where people work. So if anyone, and you may, you may not have had the resources to ever book an outdoor media campaign, but if you have, they are based on um, where people live, footfall, traffic through uh, potential um, areas. Now you can combine the geographical with the demographic um, and I'm sure many of you have heard of Acorn um, or Mosaic, which are two of the leading commercial um, audience segmentation, um, sorry, segmentation tools. They're not arts and, and heritage specific. These are just general. Um, and they have a whole range of classifications of the population um, using postcode data. Um, it's quite interesting because where I live, um, I would be classed in a particular type of uh, grouping, um, which actually isn't really who I am because it's based on postcode data. And um, so there are limitations um, with that uh, model. Next slide, please, Jack. I should say I live, I live in a mid-terraced house um, and there is a, there's a, they sort of make assumptions as to if you live in a mid-terraced house, therefore you are in this kind of grouping. Um, there's also the attitudinal and psychographic, and this is much more what um, you may have come across if you've used the audience agency's um, audience spectrum or Maurice Hargreaves McIntyre's culture segments, and I'm going to talk about both of those um, uh, later on in the session. And this is much more about trying to connect with your personal interests and your beliefs and your values what motivates people to make the choices that they do, what their priorities are, and particularly what their attitudes to culture are and, and your segment. Um, so if you think about um, a brand like Apple, uh, which I am sat here on my MacBook with my iPhone by my side, um, there's, um, people have a, a, a personal connection to, to brands and that's what the attitudinal psychographic segmentation is trying to tap into. Thanks, Jack. So all of those models rely on data and data is information. So um, you will have audience data in various different formats. Some of you may have um, some form of advanced booking system. You may not have had pre-COVID, but you may have now. Um, it'll be interesting to know, and this is maybe something just to, to pop in the chat and I'll, I'll be asking later on, is whether any of you are, are think, have, have done that and are now working with those systems and are going to carry on working with those systems, how that's changed the way that you maybe work. And particularly, um, 
if you have been charging for any online activities or how people are booking for those online activities. So you, your existing visitors in real life and online will be sharing data um, with you. So whether that's um, through a, a ticket desk or, or a cafe, if you have a cafe or through events on person in line, sorry, online or hybrid through your website, because if you are tracking user behavior on your website, through social media, through your email mailing list, if you have those as well. So there's lots of data that you will have you may not have, have necessarily be looking at it as, as a whole. And of course, the other thing is, um, it's important to think about capturing data of, of those uh, existing attenders, visitors, audiences, whatever term um, we want to use, but also thinking about how do you get to the people who are not um, engaging with you. And particularly online is an opportunity that I'm sure many of you found through the, the pandemic that you have been engaging with people online who you may never have engaged with um, before. So depending on what data you want to collect, um, and it's really important to think about why you want to collect data, then you think about what the methodologies are. So there's no point collecting data if you don't know what you're going to do with it. Um, I, I do recall many um, an organization over the years where I've gone in to work as a consultant and seen a box of surveys on the floor that have been untouched, that haven't been inputted into any kind of um, system um, and probably not adhering to any data protection either, just left on the floor. Um, and so there's a sense of, well, we need to ask we need to ask our audiences but only ask them what you need to know so the, the here on the screen are just some examples of different kinds of ways and i'm sure many of you are doing lots of this already so whether that's face-to-face -face surveys or, or clicking as people are coming into the to the museum or online surveys or social media polls um, or focus groups you may have advisory panels different voting mechanisms. We've just, we've just done two, uh, a Zoom poll and, uh, and a menti, uh, menti.com, um, informal vox pops. Uh, so that's where you might just record uh, a couple of questions with, with a member of the audience. Observational research, which is something that's so important, particularly um, for museums. And you're probably doing this quite often without even realizing it. I know I, as a marketing and audience development consultant, I can't go anywhere without sort of mentally scanning who is there and thinking about why they're there, um, occupational hazard. Um, feedback walls, there may be all sorts of ways, you, very basic with, um, I know that um, uh, this is a cinema example, but Pictureville Cinema in, in Bradford at the National um, Science and Media Museum, they have a blackboard where people can just put up either films they want to see or, or mini film festivals they might want. One-to-one -one telephone interviews, probably unlikely, quite expensive to do. Um, journey mapping, this is something that you can do um, online, thinking about how people are coming to find you, what they're engaging with through your website and online channels. And I'm going to share, share a couple of examples with you later on around that. And just that general creative feedback, if you provide that opportunity for people. I know I'm sure that many of your visitor services staff or your volunteers are on, on a daily basis are, are getting some of that feedback from your visitors. So um, there's more information that uh, some of you may know, um, the, the, uh, the brilliant museums, um, uh, and heritage consultant Emma Parsons and I've taken some of that information from a, a really good guide that she's done for the Association of Independent Museums. The link is on the screen will be in the PowerPoint when you get that all about understanding your audiences. Thanks Jack. Next slide please. So a little exercise. Um, bearing in mind we've just been talking about data information. I want you just to, to jot down and pop this in the, the chat what information you have or you think you have about your um, visitors. Let's, let's think specifically, because we're talking about online visitors here, on, um, 
about your online visitors, but feel free to throw in anything else as well. And I'll just keep an eye on, on the chat. I won't pick on anyone, don't worry. Okay, so we've got first first ones there. It's, hello, Neris, nice to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. Um, so uh, Sam at Fusiliers says to collect um, demographic and geographical data currently. Stephen says website analytics. Solvig has said the re researched in person, only researched in person visitors focused on behavior and attitude. Lisa's saying Google Analytics tells us demographic and geographic information. Rachel said gender, age and location from Facebook data. Kim, mostly geographical and demographic and some attitudinal via social media. Errol Graham, only done in-person surveys, not done anything via website yet. Megan, geographical demographics. Sienna, uh, demographic and geographical from our analytics too. Charlotte, gender, thank you for all of these, this is great. Gender, age, and location from Facebook data as well. Catherine, we can tell people's interests from online data, what specific figures bring them to the museum. Claire, socials from both museums and use Facebook and Instagram, demographic mainly. So there's a lot coming through here about um, social media analytics, e-news data. Some people, so Lauren's done online surveys to collect some qualitative data as well. Simon, whatever we can get from Google Analytics, web stats. Um, great. So it so there's a this is this is the thing about um, data and where you can access data is there is a lot that you can get hold of um, if you are um, appropriately setting up the analytics um, for your website and e newsletter and social media. Thanks very much for, for sharing all that. That's really helpful. Um, we'll, come, we'll come on to using that um, more proactively um, as well. So Jack, do you want to just pop to the next slide? Brilliant, thank you. So just gonna talk about um, good practice in data collection and I'm, and I'm sure you're all already doing this and we all, we all remember the headache that was GDPR coming in and the uh, contrasting information that was flying around. And I know of some organizations, and it, it, it breaks my heart to, to still think this, that they scrapped their whole mailing lists because they didn't understand GDPR. Um, I think we've all got a better handle now, and there are some really useful guides. Uh, obviously, the Arts Council and their Digital Culture Network have uh, various guides that you can access now. So it's Always remember, um, if you hold any consumer data, there's specific accountability that you need to think about. Um, at any point, if anyone's joined their mailing list, they can request access to the data you hold on them. So you have to think about what is your process if you get one of those queries coming in, unlikely, but if, but if you did, it's likely to be if there's been some form of data breach, and then that's a whole different ball game, which I'll come on to. So only process the data that you need. This is called data minimization. So if, you, if the data that you have, you cannot actually um, recognize that individual. So for example, if you have just postcode data, then, um, there's, there's, there isn't the same GDPR um, uh, regulations to that because you can't identify an individual. But if you have a name and an email address, that's, that's classified as personal uh, data. Um, don't collect things you don't need. So if you're never going to do any kind of postal communication, then you don't need to collect postal addresses anymore. Um, Usually people tend to collect name, email address, but actually collecting a postcode is really useful when it comes to segmentation. So think about what, um, what data you need and only collect the data that you absolutely need. And um, it's worth checking your privacy policies for your website, especially if you haven't looked at it in years. 
um, or since GDPR came in? Is it still fit for purpose? Are you really clear in your privacy policy how you are collecting data, what you're collecting and what will be done with it? If you're not, um, then you need to address that. And the other thing is how long are you collecting that data for? So if it's project specific and people have given you their data for a fixed period of time, once that project's gone, you need to get rid of the data. Um, and we're really bad in our sector at hanging on to stuff. Um, so if, it's for, if they're joining to be on your mailing list, then they will assume that they will be sent information about what you've got on. But if you've engaged them in just in a project, if you want to continue communicating with them, you will have to ask them. Okay, next uh, slide, please, Jack. So I, I just mentioned about um, GDPR, um, the Data Protection uh, Act, the confidentiality. Now, we don't know what's going to happen with um, us coming out of the EU because obviously GDPR was something that was very much brought in um, by the EU. So that will be interesting to see. I believe at the moment uh, we're going to carry on, um, but that's one just to keep an eye on. Um, have you done an audit from a data security perspective as to what data you have, what databases you have, what backup processes you have, um, who has access to that data, that data? This is really, really important. So does your whole organization have access or have you got limited access to the, only the people who are going to use that data? There are ways you can restrict access depending on, your, on the database. I mentioned the privacy uh, policy. Um, I don't think, and I may be wrong, but it's unlikely that, that you've got data sharing agreements. You tend to find that more in the performing arts sector, unless you are part of a, a bigger um, organization of museums or maybe part of a local authority network. So that's something to, um, to have a check on. Someone within your organization, if you, have, if you have public data, should be registered as your data protection officer with the information commissioner's office. I'm not sure, I know that's in England, and forgive me, I should have checked on Wales, but I suspect it's similar in um, Wales. Um, if you are part of a local authority or a, a bigger museums group, though it's likely that someone else has that, but you need to find out who it is in case there is any form of data breach. And if there is any form of data, and I'm not trying to scare you here, it's best to be pre prepared, forewarned, forearmed, that you know what happens if there's some form of data breach and you can deal with that effectively and quickly. The other thing is, and there have been recent changes in safeguarding in terms of data for children. I think it's under 12. So if you hold any data, uh, that relates to uh, children, you need to check that um, you are adhering to the relevant guidelines. Um, there's a link on the screen that uh, the Association of Independent Museums have a really good guide on, on GDPR as well. But the Information Commissioner's Office, and just if you Google them, it'll come up at the top. Um, they've got good search engine optimization, as you would expect. Um, lots of information on there. And you can also go through and find out what you should have in place. Thanks, Jack. So, thinking about your online audiences, what do you want to achieve and why? So, there's a list here. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, if you want to engage with online audiences, why do you want to do that? And what do you, what do you want to do with, with the, that engagement? So, do you just want them to attend something you're putting on online? Do you want them to be more proactive as far as online engagement? Not, and I can't stress this enough, online engagement is not just about increasing your number of followers on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever platform you're on. Um, it's not a numbers game, actually. It's about the level of engagement. And it's about what those calls to action are, what, you then, what those audiences then go on to do. Um, do they go on to then book tickets either to attend something in real life, whether that's whether that's free or paid for? Is it about booking their place at an online event or if you're planning to do hybrid, how would that work? 
it may be that um, you can uh, encourage merchandise sales if you sell uh, merchandise. Thinking about that fundraising journey, how if you get people engaged online, how can you then try and engage them to potentially donate to you, whether that's a one-off donation or regular, or even to become a member, whatever your membership structure might be. Obviously, engaging with you online, you really want them to sign up to your emailing list so that you can have that regular contact with them. But it might also be that using online mechanisms is a way to encourage them to visit in person um, as well. Or it might be that you think, you know what, actually, the more we do online, the more we can reach new audiences. And you need to think about what audiences are you talking about? Or it might be that you think, you know, actually delivering a program of a lot of online activity is about us being much more accessible and inclusive to audiences who either can't engage with us or have limited uh, access to engage with us in person. Or it might be that you want them to share their content. It could be a whole range of reasons. It could be a multiple on that list. And I think it's really important that you identify what it is you want those online audiences to do, what the relationship is you want with those online audiences, because you're thinking about the long term. This is not about short term one off engagement. You, ideally, you want to develop those long term um, relationships. Thanks, Jack. So, of course, in doing that, that then helps you to measure what your classification of success is. Um, and your success might be <clears throat> we've got this many people attending this online talk or we've actually managed to convert um, so many of them into signing up to our e-newsletter list, or we've managed to get some donations. Whatever those um, conversion goals are from that last slide, you can look at measurements through different analytics tools. And again, this is not an exhaustive list at all. I know from the question that I asked before that a lot of you are already using Google Analytics. Um, and of course, Google Analytics has now brought out Google Analytics 4, which is quite different again. So I'm sure that some of you will be grappling with getting to, to grips with Google Analytics 4. Um, I should say there's various training and training on that specifically that the Digital Culture Network do. And I'm, I'm sure the AMA at some point may be doing that as well. I'm just speaking on behalf of Jack there, so apologies. Um, but whichever Google Analytics you're, you're doing, are you using it to the best of your knowledge? Could you be getting more information out of um, Google Analytics? Are you setting up campaigns effectively on Google Analytics um, as well? Hotjar is one which, uh, again, you can do a free trial. Uh, I, I don't know the costs if you were uh, paying for it, but Hotjar, Hotjar uh, helps you understand uh, visitor behavior on websites. It can also give you heat maps and, and things like that. I'm sure a lot of you are already using MailChimp. Um, MailChimp, uh, the e-newsletter uh, platform, which also can give you um, good analytics. So open rates and click-through rates. Um, so seeing how many people have engaged with particular stories and click through to your website. Because when you're doing e-newsletters, it's always good practice to have some kind of click-through for engagement rather than the whole story just in that section uh, of a newsletter, because this is about trying to get people to be more actively engaged with you. As many of you have mentioned, the social media platforms themselves have various uh, analytics. I know Facebook has just changed, but they have Facebook Business Suite, Pixel and Conversions API, Creator Studio, they have all these things. So you sort of have to keep on top of <clears throat> all of these social media analytics because they do change them and, up and upgrade them. Some of you may use Hootsuite, and again, you can use that as a free um, tool, and that helps you to schedule um, social media posts, and there's various versions of that as well. So it's worth having a look at um, what you're doing, what's out there, and talking to each other and seeing what they're using that you might be able to learn from um, as well. Thanks, Jack. 
So actually, we've, we've come a little bit early, so I think we might just skip on and then we'll come back to the to the break. Um, so we've got 15 minutes before you're having a break. Um, so I'm going to start uh, now just talking about um, the actual audience segmentation tools that have been designed specifically for the arts and uh, museums sector. Um, can I have a quick show of hands for who is already using audience spectrum? Lots of shaking heads, actually. And then I can't see a lot of people. OK, so this has um, started. I can see, I can see a hand up there. Thank you. Um, this has uh, now been rolled out in Wales as well as England. And I think it's being rolled out in Scotland and also some international uh, companies as well. This is a tool that the audience agency have created and it is based on their audience finder UK national data set. What that means is they collect data from um, box office systems, obviously performing arts, but also survey data from museums as well. Some of you may be in that uh, data set. Um, probably most of you aren't. You can still use audience spectrum. Um, if you provide data that goes into the data set, you, your, your data will be profiled through audience spectrum for free. If you're not in the national data set, you can still get audience data profiled, but there will be a charge. So this is uh, the recognized tool uh, that the Arts Council England um, support, um, as well as Arts Council uh, Wales. The, um, it's worth having a look on their website. If you just Google um, uh, the audience agency, audience spectrum, uh, you'll find it very easily. And they have categorized um, audience segments into 10 different groups in three types. Um, from high cultural engagement, medium cultural engagement, and low cultural engagement. Now they also uh, use household and, and postcode um, data. They look at existing um, attender behavior and also look at potential attenders. And they are looking at um, behavior, not just patterns of consumption. Forgive me for the marketing language here. Um, so not just people who are attending museums, um, but understanding why they're attending museums and why, say, you may not be reaching some of those people who are interested in museums in your area. So if we can just go to the next slide. Um, and I should say, actually, there's a couple of links on that slide. They have done some additional research during the pandemic to understand how the pandemic has affected those segments. So there's some good links there to have a look at. Thanks, Jack. So the different segments that they have identified are the, in orange at the top are the three cult, highly culturally engaged sectors. So metro culturals, most of those are in, in, London, in Greater London, London. You will find some in some of the other major urban centres, but as a small percentage. Commuter land culture buffs, um, kind of how it sounds. Um, experience seekers, they tend to be younger. Um, and then you've got in the mid range, dormitory dependables, home and heritage, trips and treats. Um, the heritage aspect is obviously very important for those three medium level um, engagement. Um, tend to be a bit more mainstream, whereas uh, experience seekers will be looking for something new, something different, something that they can um, that they can share with uh, their their online um, uh, networks. And then at the bottom, in in that blue colour, you've got. Um, four of the low cultural engagement segments, Up Our Street, Facebook Families, Kaleidoscope, Creativity and Heydays. So these are what you might term as harder to reach kinds of communities. It doesn't mean that they don't engage with culture at all. It's just that, that arts, culture, heritage museums is not necessarily part of their regular day-to-day -day activity. 
they have much more price sent price and value sensitivity um but they um some of them don't have as much access to um digital uh um tools whether that's free wi-fi smartphones um uh the internet um so if you have a look on the the audience agency audience spectrum site there's much more detail about each of those uh, segments and even if you don't have the data that you can be part of um, the audience finder data set and use audience spectrum it's really useful just to read through because it will get you into the mindset of thinking about audiences and behaviors and attitudes to museums um, so for some of them, it goes into the detail of the kinds of newspapers they might read, um, how reliant they are, they are on public transport, for example, um, what kind of, of experiences they're looking for. So those that are driven by the needs of their, their children, um, lots more, lots of detail uh, around that as well. Thanks, Jack. So I'm going to go on to a different model now, which some of you may have come across. Anybody uh, using culture segments? Just put your hand up. Okay, no, doesn't look, doesn't look like that I can see quickly. Um, culture segments is, um, there's a lot of museums uh, have been using uh, culture uh, segments. It is a, a system that's been set up by Morris Hargreaves McIntyre, who are another uh, research agency uh, based um, in England. They have something called their audience atlas system, which is the data that um, Culture Segments is drawing from. And it covers 60 art forms and leisure activities, and that does include um, museums. Um, it's a psychographic tool, so it's very much based on people's cultural values, beliefs and, and motivations. And in fact, if you go onto their website, and again, if you just uh, look for Morris Hargreaves McIntyre culture segments, you can actually take a little survey and find out which segment you're in. Um, and I'll show you those segments in, in, a, in a moment. And it's again, it's about having a better understanding of your existing uh, visitors as well as your potential visitors. So they've categorized their segments into eight different segments and all different demographic groups fit into those eight segments. So if we just have the, the next slide, please. So their eight segments are entertainment, enrichment, release, stimulation, perspective, expression, essence, and affirmation. So very much looking at the reasons why people engage with museums so for some people it might just be a pure entertainment something to do day out take the kids for others it might be much more about their their needing to learn wanting to find out more self um, improvement <clears throat> some of them it might be much more around they're looking for um, stimulation they're looking um, for some kind of challenge um, they're looking for new experiences that's um, quite different to, to what they've had before. Or it could just be that museums are absolutely core to who they are as a person and museums is something that they do on a, on a regular basis. So there's a whole range of, of different reasons there um, that you can have a, a good route through and, and have a look at. And I'm going to um, uh, give you some links later on as well. So you can have a look at that in a bit more detail. Thanks, Jack. But, and there's always a but, um, audience segmentation models, because these models have been going for a while, were originally based on in-person attendance. And they are reliant on data like postcodes. And as far as I can see, and I've, and I've done my homework before this session, there aren't any specific online audience segmentation tools for uh, the museums sector or, or the arts sector and they've not been really adapted yet and I say yet because I'm sure they, that there'll be work going on to do that and nor do they take account of that the what what we're now terming hybrid events so where some people may be attending in person 
some people may be attending online, but I'm sure that will that will come. But what they can do is tell you about different people's um, digital access and digital consumption. So at least you can understand whether someone who is in, in say, a low cultural engagement category, if we're looking at uh, audience spectrum, or if they're in, thank you, Lauren, for putting uh, the link in the, uh, in the chat there, digital audience survey findings, because that link is in my PowerPoint later on. So brilliant, thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, they can tell you about the kinds of digital consumption that people um, are accessing. There is new data on audiences during uh, digital audiences during COVID-19, which is the link that Lawrence uh, just put in, in the uh, chat. Um, now, of course, we need to bear in mind that that was a particular point of time and we don't yet know what the impact is longer term. I mean, we're not quite post pandemic yet, but, you know, places are back open. We don't know what that impact is as far as people's online behaviour, how much they're going to continue engaging with online um, experiences. So we have a good idea of what happened during those lockdown months, and that does give us information, but we need to think about how that's going to change um, for the longer term. So I think that might be a good point now before I go on to another slide, if that's all, all right, Jack, just to, uh, to take a 10 minute break. So might just, thanks Jack. If you want to bring the uh, PowerPoint back up, that would be great. Thank you. So just before we go on to this um, first, so try and ignore the screen while I just mentioned, um, I have put uh, a couple of links in the chat uh, for the Information Commissioner's Office, Audience Agency, Audience Spectrum, and Maurice Hargreaves McIntyre's culture segments, if you want to have a look at those. Um, just before we start on some case studies, um, I just want to ask another question and just pop in the chat. How many of you have been using any kind of online booking for either online events and or in person? And what form of booking system have you used, whether that's Eventbrite or whether it's a, a, a different type of um, booking system? Oh, so we've got Emily Jane said Art Tickets, Lauren said Eventbrite. And oh, there's lots here. I'll try and I'll try and read through. Uh, so Art Tickets, Ticket Tailor, quite a few with Eventbrite. At least their own bespoke system, Galaxy. Yes, as a product in our shop, Digi Tickets, Eventbrite, Tessa Chura for visits to the museum, Eventbrite, Art Tickets. Art Tickets have done well out of um, uh, out of uh, the situation we've been in. Old fashioned paper system for visits. Nice, thanks, thanks, Neris. Um, if in doubt. <coughs> um, great. So it's interesting that that, and I presume that some of you. Um, Claire Spectrix for some on our own website booking forms. Great. So, so it's a mix. So some of you have got um, ticketing systems, which means you'll be able to much more easily collect data. Eventbrite has its limitations because you can't get uh, the detail of data. Um, and, uh, and then Art Tickets is something that's been set up as a result of the, um, the pandemic. Um, so Annette Castle do online bookings to access all the site. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Sam. Thank you for that, everyone. Um, I may ask you some question, more questions later on um, around that. So I've I've been looking at uh, Catherine. Do you have a question, or have you just popped your your hand up? It's gone. It's gone. Okay, thank you. Um, so no, don't worry, Catherine. It's fine. Um, I have um, been digging around to find some examples of um, specific uh, research that has been done on online audiences in museums and galleries um, sector. 
and uh, I wanted to find some examples that are in the public domain so that they could be shared today, but also on the YouTube um, recording as well. And actually, it's quite difficult. Um, yes, there have, there's been some research done of uh, things that have happened last year, and I'm going to share one of those um, with you. But I think it's, this is a real area where we're going to see a lot more research taking place. Now there's that, as, as Sarah said, right at the start of the session, now there's that understanding of the importance of online engagement and our online audiences. We need to find out more, and so we're therefore going to need to do um, research. So I've, I've found a, a, an example, and this is pre-COVID, it's quite a few years uh, pre-COVID, but I think there's a lot of relevant learning um, from it. The link to more detail is on the bottom of this screen. And there's a piece of research done by, um, and I'm gonna get this, the, the pronunciation of this wrong, uh, Eleanor Villaspeza, hopefully that's near. Um, and this was very much to look at the uh, online audiences for the Tate's website. And particularly, they looked at a section of the website. Now, bearing in mind, organizations like the Tate have huge amount of content on their website so that we're looking at a different scale but I think there's some useful learnings because they've looked at a specific section on the website the art and artist section and they wanted to understand why people were engaging with this section of the website and what they were doing um, and particularly to help them to make improvements on not just the content production but actually how easy it was to find information, understanding what, because understanding what people were looking for and why. Some of the findings that, findings that they discovered were that they were seen as a valuable and trustworthy resource about art and that it was a good place to search for a particular artist. So what they did was they, they created their own online segmentation the four different categories of online audiences. So Jack, if we can pop to the next slide. Now, don't worry if you can't see this very clearly if you're working on a small screen, I'm gonna talk through it and you'll be able to get the PowerPoint um, afterwards. So they created this, their segmentation of four different types of online user, audience, visitor. So in the, the top right, got researchers, top, uh, sorry, top left researchers, top right art enthusiasts, bottom left self-improvers, bottom right explorers. And they're working on the horizontal access from left to right, from it, the motivation from intellectual to emotional, and the vertical axes, which is knowledge of art, from the top specialist through to the bottom, little knowledge of art. So um, in that top left corner, in the category they've called researchers, they found that people were um, had a specialist knowledge of art and that there was an intellectual motivation for visiting. So it might be that they were actually, say doing a PhD or writing a paper or something like that. So they were looking for research papers. They wanted to access the Turner catalog and they were using the search functionality within the art and artist section. And they were also watching conference video recordings. So very particular reasons, knowing what they were looking for through um, the site. And then the top right corner, the art enthusiasts. So these people have got a good knowledge of, of art, but it wasn't a, an intellectual kind of learning reason for accessing this section of the site. This was much more about a personal emotional reason, something that they had a general um, interest in. And they were accessing information about art trends and news. They were watching specialized videos. They were reading art reviews. They were reading interviews about artists and they were interacting with some of the um, visual interactive elements um, in that section of the site. And we go down to the bottom left that they call self improvers. So these people not got a great knowledge of, of art, but they want to learn. And so they were participating in online courses and accessing learning resources. They also have a homework help resources. So they were using that to help guide their, their learning journeys. 
they were browsing by subject rather than artist or um, art category. And they were using the glossary of art terms because obviously uh, some of those terminology they, di they didn't understand. And then in the final category, the bottom right category of explorers. So these people, again, not very, not, not a strong knowledge of, of art in, particularly, in particular, but an interest in, in art, much more of a, a personal leisure um, interest. And so they were engaging with a lot of the visual aspects uh, of the site, the images and slideshows, but also some of the, they were coming to the site through other mechanisms like social media um, interaction and some of those more interactive tools um, and browsing by color rather than by art um, form, um, art genre or artist. So it really helped them to then shape their content to meet those different needs and also to work internally in the organization to say, right, we need this, this type of content. Will you help us deliver this type of content? And also they could then track that and see um, how that was being uh, used uh, and keep refining what they were doing. So she carried out this research in 2014, which seems an age ago now. Um, and what they found was that um, this section of the website, the art and artists, um, was the most visited part of the website with approximately 40% of users visiting these pages while browsing the site with over with around half a million visits per month, which I know is, is big figures. But it really helps them to think, well, if this part of the site is getting so much usage, we need to focus resources um, on this part of the site. So thank you for, for that, Jack. We'll go on to the next. Um, slide. So another big example, but I always think it's really useful to see what some of the big players are doing, because we can take learnings and adapt for ourselves, because they, they're obviously, of, often they're the first ones doing some of, some of these big pieces of, of research because they have the resources. So the Science Museum Group spent two years researching their online audiences. So again, this is, this is pre-COVID. Um, and they were particularly looking at um, certain things that came through in those findings that, that people wanted to see well-structured content, which I know might sound obvious, um, but sometimes we, we forget in the desire, and particularly last year in, in so many organizations were throwing content online, not thinking about who it was for or how it looked or what they were trying to do. And I'm sure none of you went through that. Um, findability, so how easy is it for people to find the information they're looking for? Um, what kind of media choices? So are they looking for written content, video content, audio content? What type of, of um, media? So it's really important to think about that because some people, we, we assume everybody's very visual, but not everyone is. And particularly from an access point of view, we've seen the um, resurgence in audio content. I'm a massive podcast um, fan, but we mustn't forget that some people, they're accessing content in different ways. And, you know, for me, going for a walk and listening to podcasts I, I will listen to things that relate to, to museums whilst I'm on a, on a walk, not just when I'm sat in front of a screen. And, and they're looking for enjoyable, <laughs> they're looking to, to, to enjoyable content. It, it, this isn't just about, you know, uh, not that any of us would do this, but worthy information. This is about uh, fun and entertainment as well. And similarly with the Tate, that the Science Museum Group is seen as a trusted starting point to explore issues relating to science. So their online user profile, um, it's not categorized in the same way as the Tate, but that, that breakdown of realizing that they, they have a lot of people who are accessing them for study. And I know that for, for most of you on this call, if not all of you, you will have people who have a particular research interest and specialism in a topic, subject matter, elements of your collection, 
um, and that's why they're coming um, to you. They may have a professional interest, so an, an, another museum or someone working in the sector who, who wants to find out more information. I spend a lot of time going through um, uh, websites within museums, galleries, theatre, festivals as part of my work. Um, and so I'm very attuned to ease of access of content um, uh, as well. It may just be personal reasons. It might be someone who has a particular interest in say, climate change and thinks actually the Science Museum group have been doing some interesting things. I want to watch a talk that they've been doing. They've just had a series of, of, of talks about that. They may have a, a, another interest and they've come to the Science Museum group from, from something else. So it's not science led or they may have no particular interest in science or, or don't identify as having an interest in science. So they may have come through it from a historical route, but they've come to the Science Museum group. So not making assumptions that everybody coming to you is interested in the core element of your offer. They may be coming from different angles. What it allowed them to do was to build that internal collaboration, to talk to other members of their team to say, actually, we're finding that a lot of people are engaging with this type of content. So we want to develop more of this type of content. And what I should say in developing content, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to take, a, um, it doesn't have to cost a lot. People are not necessarily looking for really polished content. They're looking for content that reflects your brand. So think about that. You can do really good stuff with a smartphone. Now, obviously, nobody wants to see a jerky video or um, have an audio where you can't hear what's happening. You do need to think about access, though, with content. And I know this will come up much more in your next session on, on content, so I'm not going to um, uh, touch on that too much. But obviously, as today, we've got Maria doing the, the captioning. So subtitles, captioning, all of that sort of thing you need to need to think about um, audio description um, depending on the on the kind of content that you're you're doing. The other thing is about um, informing their story content. And the wonderful thing is, as a sector, museums are awash with fabulous stories. All aspects of what you do, people, collections everything you've got amazing stories to tell and you are telling those amazing stories so think about how you can use some of those in your content but to tell a story over a period of time how do the stories you're telling connect and build your brand online for those audiences over a period of time and of course the other thing is you can then um uh, track the engagement with that content. So if you set up your analytics effectively, you can then track what that engagement um, is. And it's just cut off at the, the, the bottom of the screen, but when you get the PowerPoint, there is a link um, where the Science Museum has shared some of their findings from this piece of research. Thank you, just go on to the, the next slide. So. I want a quick um, on in the chat function. How many of you took part in the curate hashtag curator battle from last year that York Museums Trust um, set up? And and which element was there a particular? I can see some hands going up. Loved taking part. Neris Lawrence put a hand up. Um, was there any particular battle that you? were involved in or were you involved in in multiple battles just just give me either a, a a hands up or just pop something in the chat while you're doing that um multiple says lauren uh simon was furloughed but ah uh, but your intern stood in did a pretty good job that's good viking coins from a dowling so Nery said not all were appropriate but we took part in many yes obviously depending on on the um on the source. I wonder if there was one about toilets, Neris, you'd have won that one hands down. Um, so, uh, and I should say for anyone who doesn't know, Glaston Pottery Museum has the fabulous collect collection of ceramic toilets. 
Um, sanitary wear, sorry, sorry, no, san sanitary wear, I'll get the terminology right. Um, so for those who may not have been um, aware or <clears throat> maybe did take part, um, York Museums Trust set up hashtag curator battle and it ran from the 20th of March till the 24th of July last year. Now, originally their, their thoughts about doing it were about engaging with other museums during this incredibly difficult first lockdown period, but also as a way to engage the public um, online. And they started off thinking this is a way to showcase the collections and objects. And what worked really well is, as I mentioned about stories, this was a great way to tell stories, to use these incredible collections that our museums um, across the world have, but to do it with humour as well. But they didn't just set it up and then, and then think afterwards, oh, what, what did we achieve? They, they put the evaluation measures in place so that they could track the campaign. And there's some stats here from the campaign and there's a link at the bottom with much more information and stats uh, about the impact of the Curator Battle uh, campaign. They engaged with more than 1.6 million people. Uh, 6.2 million people saw York Museum Trust objects alone, never mind all of the other objects that everyone shared. They increased their Twitter followers by 17,350. Now, obviously, it's not just about the followers, as, as, you, as you remember me saying, but they, they gained 50% new audiences off the back of that. And of course, there was the worldwide media coverage Anyone who got in early with some um, online creativity for around engagement tended to get some really good coverage. Um, they identified that some of the best battles were hashtag creepiest object, hashtag best museum bum, hashtag best bling, and of course, hashtag best cat. Um, so, and I, I followed uh, and many of them and, and it was a really, um, it was a really positive um, engagement at a really difficult time um, during that first uh, lockdown. Thank you, Jack. Next, next slide. Um, and then as my the last case study uh, that I'm going to talk about in any detail, I'm sure a lot of you are very well aware of the, the Museum of London and the work that they do online. <clears throat> Excuse me. need a sip of water um, what they've done they have their they have a youtube channel and i'm sure many of you um, do as well and they've actually categorized it by subject so i've just taken a snapshot here of their youtube uh, uh, channel page and you can see on the top line it's all fashion uh, the next one is women's history month the next one is lgbtq plus history month they've got wednesday walks they've got, they've got black history month they've got all sorts of things. So it's very easy to find if you have particular interests in certain subjects, but also for anyone going on or coming to it through say a social media link. So say I've clicked on something um, that's fashion related and then I can say, oh, actually they've done lots of different videos. I think I may watch some of these others. So it's a way to to bring people in, to spend more time and engage with the museum and the stories that the museum has to tell. So I think it's, it's worth thinking about, just because you did something two years ago, doesn't mean it doesn't have any value now. Um, I often get frustrated when, when I see clients who they've almost just dumped content that they've produced in the past. Now, obviously if something is horrendously out of date, um, then you need to review that or you, or you need to, to profile it in a way that makes it clear that it is now out of date. But you will have some amazing content and people love rooting through your archives of content. I, I certainly do. I'm, um, as well as being a big museums fan, I'm also a huge dance fan and, and film um, as well. So I will often you know, go down that rabbit hole of starting to watch something and then get connected to something else. So if you are particularly interested in a, sub, in a subject, make it easy for those people to find your content and spend more time engaging with you because the more engaged they are with you, the more likely they are to come back, to recommend you to others, 
through sharing content online, potentially to become, to donate to something. So I found myself during lockdown, obviously there was loads of free content coming out as, as you remember, but then there's been a bit of a transition to some organizations starting to charge for, for content. And there were certain dance companies, particularly dance companies around the world that obviously I wouldn't normally get to see, where I'm, I'm willing to pay, not huge amounts to be fair, because I do watch a lot, but I'm willing to pay a contribution, a donation, if you like, to watch something in place of a, of a ticket, because I'm getting access, I, I wouldn't get any, any other way. What I would just couch, and I've got this with a theatre client at the moment, it's a new theatre, that's being built is they're very excited about the opportunity to engage with people all over the world and I said realistically the majority of people who are going to engage with you online are already engaged in museums and or already engaged with you yes you will be able to get to other people but the majority of the people engaging with you online have already got an interest they're already in that high high culturally engaged category so in the same way as it's it's it needs more resources to get to those potential visitors who are not engaging with museums at all in person it is the same for online as well you can make it a bit easier for them to find you but don't assume that suddenly you're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of people engaging with you from all over the world um, unless anyone's done that, well done to you. Do share. I'd love to. I'd love to know. Um, okay. So, thank, thank you, Jack. Um, um, we've got a couple more slides, and then I'm going to open up for questions. So, if you do have questions, a reminder, please pop them uh, in the chat. So, specifically thinking about how you use audience segmentation to inform your communications, whether that's using. Um, a, a tool like audience spectrum or culture segments or whether that's that you you develop your own segmentation because if you don't have much data that might be difficult so it's quite often a good idea with colleagues to sort of brainstorm the type of visitors who are engaging with you develop personas um, Online personas is something that all digital agencies do. If any of you have been through a, a website development process, um, you will have probably found that your digital agency has worked with you to develop online personas. So what type of, of visitor and start to build um, an idea, give them a name. Um, so, you know, Jill, She's 45, she lives locally, she's got teenage kids, she, she comes to certain types of events. We found that she was engaging with us online for education related content during pan, the pandemic. She's on our email uh, mailing list, she doesn't tend to engage with us on social media. So to just to help you start framing the types of online um, personas who are engaging with your online experience and then once you've got that you can start testing that out and think have we got that right have we made too many assumptions there so in the same way that you are thinking about your in real life um, attenders visitors audiences you need to think holistically about online I would say don't think about them as two separate things. Think about them as interconnected because chances are they, a lot of them will be engaging with you in real life as well as online. So think about that holistically. Whatever you're doing online, set relevant targets or key performance indicators conversion goals, whatever you, you call those uh, type of, of measurements. So you're clear and you can measure how well you're doing. So make sure if you do a specific kind of online campaign that you set that up appropriately in your analytics so that you can monitor. And if you're not regularly looking at your analytics, 
I would recommend you start doing that and start digging into the analytics and seeing what it can tell you. If you're not very confident around that, there's loads of res free resources and training that you can access, particularly in the museum sector, actually. And obviously the AMA does that kind of thing as well, um, that you can access to build your confidence around using those kinds of tools. Now, with any kind of, of data, the data itself isn't telling you much. It's the insight that you attribute to that data. So what are the stories that the data is telling you? And that's what's going to help you in making your decisions. So as I mentioned earlier, with the impact of COVID-19, we're really starting to understand what that kind of online behaviour was during the pandemic. What we don't know yet is how that's translating to behaviour going forwards. We've had other major movements like the hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, there's lots of, of big things that have been happening over the last year that have impacted on, on the kind of content that is available and how people are engaging with that content. And where do you sit um, within that as well? What have you learned from last year? The things that you would continue to do or are continuing to doing with hindsight would do differently. And I think we'd all, there'd all be things we would have done differently. So what are those learnings? And sharing those and being honest internally so that you can build on that learning for the future. And then I would say prioritize your market segments for, for online. Prioritize who it is that you want to engage with and be clear as to why you want to engage with them and what you want them to do. And then if necessary, you can map that information onto um, other data that you might collect. Um, or if you decide to use a, a, a specific audience segmentation tool, you can map your own segments onto those tools. But you do need to allocate resources. And I, I remember in the early days of digital marketing when people said, oh, it's great because it's free. It's not free you've got to allocate people resources. It takes time in the same way as any kind of audience development and marketing activity. You need to be committed. It's not something you can do in fits and starts. You need to do this consistently to build your audiences because if you're not doing it, they'll just go somewhere else. But also, as I mentioned before, think about shaping and tailoring your messaging. So one message doesn't work for everyone. So what would you say to families? Because that would be a different message than say what you would say to someone who might be in that researcher category. And how does it relate to your brand? What's your tone of voice? How is your tone of voice consistent across your in real life experience and your on, um, online experience? Because um, <clears throat> that's really important. You don't want that disconnect. Um, and then, and once you've done all of that, then you start thinking about the marketing channels. Don't start thinking about those online channels. The amount of times people say to me, should we be on TikTok? It's not about that. It's about thinking, who do you want to engage with and why? Have we got the resources to do that appropriately? So we all know about the Black Country Living Museum's wonderful TikTok um, account. Um, I didn't put this one that on because I figured most of you may already know about that one but if you don't google that because um, it's really brilliant what they've done but that that takes a lot of resources um, how, if you haven't got that level of resources and if you're not trying to get to that kind of younger market because that's what they were trying to do through TikTok then that's maybe not appropriate for you you're much better having a smaller number of channels and doing those well than spreading yourself too thinly. And then also you'd be thinking about what your, your relevant content is. And I'm going to stop there because I'm not going to talk to you about content. That's in your next workshop. So if we can just go to the, the next um, slide, um, Jack, thank you. I've just put up a link here of um, <clears throat> some relevant. Um, uh, information about segmentation, 
about uh, digital audiences um, that you can access. Uh, this is, will be in the PowerPoint as supplied to you. Um, so definitely worth um, having a look. And there's some really good tools there, like the digital culture compass, things that you can have a try, um, lots of learnings from um, other organisations. So I think that's, that's brought us to about quarter to, to 12 now. So if we just want to pop to the next slide um, and uh, time for questions. And I think, Jack, you're going to stop the recording now. Is that right? Yes.